Good morning. How are we doing today? My name is James Sweeney, aka Split Suit. Welcome to episode two of this vlog. And in this one, we're playing one two again at Orange City, and things get pretty weird. There are a bunch of interesting hands in this one, including a couple of pre-flop all ins, one that I expected to be about zero EV. So let's go review some of these spots, chat through some strategy together, and have some fun. This first hand, I mistakenly think that I am the boom blind. Actually, it turns out I will be under the gun. And this is one two with 200 max buy. That max Max by tens to make this game play a little bit more shallow. Dealer ends up correcting me. Pull my fake big blind back. Look down at ace queen offsuit. Open raise to six. Totally standard. And that smaller sizing kind of supports the overall, uh, again, compression of the game based upon that tighter max buy. Get called by the player next to act. Folds around to the button. And they decide to three bet. They go up to 27. The blinds will get out of the way, and I decide to punch it in for all of it. And the button in this situation started the hand with roughly 175. So let's talk about this for at least a moment. So the quick and dirty of this situation is the button is a female player. And while typically the assumption might be that a female player is going to be more conservative, especially when it comes to things like squeezing preflop, this is one where this player looked very, very competent and looked like they were very comfortable throwing chips in. Now, again, it's been in orbit, so I'm definitely making some assumptions with very minimal information. But one of the things I'm looking for is how quickly are people doing things? How comfortable are they when they look to be making an action? And this is someone who I think looked very, very competent in that regard. And as such, I thought was more likely to have a wider squeezing range in this situation. And of course, you can proof this out mathematically, and I would definitely suggest spending a little bit of off-table time to do so. You can use my free spreadsheets available at splitsuit.com slash sheets. And essentially, you just fill in a little bit of information. Here are the overall inputs that I threw in. And by the way, these numbers down here are coming off of the GTO app that we have coming soon from Red Chip Poker. But for the moment, I just pull them from the solver manually. And they should be squeezing here with roughly a 3% range, assuming everyone's playing GTO, calling my show with roughly the top 1.3% of hands, including kings, aces, and ace-king suited. All of those combos should be continuing. And given that, our estimated equity is going to be about 22%. And you look and say, okay, well, that's negative. That's not particularly great. And you're 100% correct in that situation. But because I think this person is playing a little bit more aggressive than they maybe should be, based upon, again, kind of the speed and the overall assumptions I'm making on them, I don't think this is going to be a 3% uh, 3 bet or squeeze range in this situation. I think that's more likely to be something closer to 10. I think their calling range probably isn't going to be exactly 1.3. Maybe it's the top 2% of hands, but even still with a slight increase on that, and that would mean a slight increase in our overall equity, you notice that this turns green very, very quickly. So if you haven't done this kind of exploration and testing before, I would definitely suggest using a tool like this. And you can use that alongside something like Equilab or Flopzilla Pro this is one of those that I've studied the spot a tremendous amount. I feel very comfortable with this shove. I think this is going to be overall good. Ace Queen is not going to be included in the GTO solvers look at what I should be shoving in this exact situation, but I think overall this is going to be a profitable play. So the caller decides to get out of the way. My opponent takes a little bit of time and we're just kind of forward through it just a little bit and they eventually end up finding the full button I think it takes about a minute minute and a half before they finally fold but this is one of those where like I don't know the more that someone is squeezing like as that squeeze frequency goes up and up and up and again I just thought that this was going to be a pretty high squeeze frequency the more that they're folding against the shove and the more you're just picking this up uncontested a lot of the time and it's not the you know largest pot in the world to fight for by any stretch, but it's 100% worth fighting for. And it also has the added benefit, just for the record, of maybe saying, hey, don't three bet and squeeze me this entire session. I would really appreciate if you didn't, because if you do, this kind of stuff is going to happen some chunk of the time which can be very, very good for overall dynamic building, especially early on in a session. So we end up shipping this little small pot, nothing to complain about, and let's move on to hand number two. All right, so we're at the same exact table, but we did change seats over to one of the wings. By the way, I don't really care for sitting in the wings. It does make for a better vlog shot, I think, but uh, it can be a little difficult for me to see board cards sometimes. I don't have the greatest vision in the entire world. But same exact table, there are two limpers, look down at king-queen of spades, pretty little hand. 
decide to attack to 15. Totally standard size, not really much reason to go bigger or smaller. 15 should do the job a good chunk of the time. End up getting called by both of the blinds, but weirdly enough, both of the limpers decide to fold. Not really sure what that's all about, but LOL live poker. End up going three-way to a not-so-great flop. It's a check in the dark by the small blind. Flop is 8-6 deuce with two hearts. No backdoor draw for us. Both players check. I check behind. Not really much reason to see bet in this situation. Just kind of check and play turns really straightforward. Turn is a king of hearts, which is nice. Check by small blind. Check by big blind. Decide to fire for 25. This should probably be just a tad larger, maybe something like 30 or 35, but at least I'm betting. But, you know, this is what kind of post analysis is really good for is go back and look at your sizings, especially and say, does that look good? Or, you know, could there be slight improvements? The more you do that, the easier it is in real time in the future to make sure you're making better decisions. So you get called by the small blind, big blind folds. River is a three of diamonds, small blind cuts out a $30 bet pretty quick, make a snap call and win with king queen and very quick fold from them. So no complaints about again another kind of medium sized pot, medium sized win and not really much else to talk about in this hand. It's just one of those that is very important that you do bet the turn, that your turn sizing is good and that you don't just auto see bet that board. I mean that flop texture is just absolutely horrific. And there's also zero reason to fold on the river. I can't really think of too many hands that I'm very nervous of. I mean, if he has four or five or something, okay, is what it is. You're just going to get paid off. But for 30, giving me roughly four to one pot odds, yeah, I'm going to be calling here a very, very good chunk of the time and also expecting to win this a good chunk of the time as well. So let's move on to hand number three. Actually, before we move on to the next hand, I have to explain what happened here because we did end up changing tables. At this point, three players at this table complained that I was recording. One was pretty cool about it. One just made a slight request and the other one was just completely irate, ended up calling the floor over, ended up breaking the entire table because of it. And look, I get if you don't want to be on a vlog table. And just for the record, I have all my permissions. I've talked with the floor. I'm super honest if anyone asks if I'm recording. There's nothing sneaky going on. Everything's a above board, no problem, floor has my back on this. But if you don't want to be on a recorded table, just leave. I don't know why you need to like have everyone bend to your will and wishes and that I need to turn my camera off. Like just chill out, move on with your life and don't get this upset about stuff. If you don't want to be in a recorded table, no problem, just move. I don't understand why it has to become this whole blow up thing. So I end up moving tables and the table that I end up getting sat at has the exact same irate dude. So he again throws another hissy fit and ends up getting moved to a different table. I end up taking his seat, which is pretty great. And we move on. And again, it's totally okay if you don't want to be at a recording table, but just please don't make it a whole thing. Just move on with your life and go forward. And with that said, let's move on to hand number three now. All right. So 10 minutes into this new table, find myself in the small blind. There's going to be a raise from under the gun to six. And under the gun is a nice older guy, introduced himself to me earlier in the day, said he liked my videos, so he definitely knows who I am. And I always appreciate when people say hello, so thank you for that. There are three callers, including the cutoff and the button, and I decide to squeeze this up to 40. And just one of those I'm not really going to call ace jack here and try to play it passively in a super multi-way pot and I think squeezing is going to do way way better and if under the gun decides to make this a war I think he's going to end up winning this one a decent chunk of the time so get a fold from the big blind boom boom Still taking his time. Okay, under the gun decides to call for 40. Under the gun plus one calls as well. Cut off folds and the button is going to take his time before eventually calling as well. It, maybe it's just a personal preference thing, but I always just prefer like make a faster action preflop, especially when it's non-committing you know you're not going to come over the top. You know you're probably calling anyway. Like, just make it a little bit faster. But that's my personal preference anyway. I like a faster game. I like to see more hands per hour. Right, the button is still thinking. Again, I think there's like a zero, zero chance this is ever getting four bet by this player. And they end up calling. 
So very, very bloated pot here, roughly 168 in the middle. Flop comes jack seven, six with two diamonds. I'm first to act and decide to continuation bet for 33 bucks. You could make an argument that maybe this should be a little bit larger, but I think this will get the job done a decent chunk of the time. I don't really want to check here and risk this getting checked through. I think there are second best hands that can and will continue. If anyone raises, we're going to have to do some math, but, and there actually is a raise from out of the gun. He goes to 108, 108 total early position two puts the rest of his stack in, which wasn't very much. I think it was like 40, give or take. And the button folds and gets out of the way. So this is kind of a really uncomfortable spot. There's definitely money left against under the gun. There would be a decent sized side pot as well if we were to commit this. And it's just one of those like, it reeks of strength. And the real question I'm asking myself is, because I mean, we're pretty much like the top of our range. I mean, Queens plus obviously, sure. And Ace Jack is kind of like the next best possible hand that I could have here that would kind of have a thought. And I hate folding hands at the absolute top of my range or near the top of my range. But this is one where like, what is he bluffing with? Now there shouldn't be a tremendous amount of value. I mean, we block jacks, pocket sevens, pocket sixes could be in here. Yes. But at the end of the day, could still have Queens, could have Kings, could possibly have aces. He may not have expected to get an additional two callers after him prefop to that 40 squeeze, but we ended up making the fold and was very pleased when under the gun ended up showing pocket sevens and yeah obviously that would have completely sucked to put the rest of it in and lose it but by the same token it's a really it's such a difficult ugly ugly spot because again i hate folding it mathematically speaking we're in a pretty darn small spr pot so you need to be extremely confident before making kind of big folds like this and the question really is is like let's just say that under the gun had a flush draw maybe like ace queen of diamonds or something like that. I'm not convinced they're always going to be raising in that situation. And if they are, maybe it's a shove and not necessarily a raise to 108. I mean, raising to 108 just sounds and looks so incredibly, incredibly strong. And it sucks making a big fold like this, but I still feel pretty confident in it against other player types or with other information. Could see this going another way, but I'm happy with the overall fold. The results oriented part of my brain is very happy with the fold as well. If you feel differently, make sure to leave a comment down below. But otherwise, let's move on to the next hand. Right, about 10 hands later, I find myself under the gun plus one. Under the gun folds, look down at a7 of hearts. Raised to six. It's a little bit light, but I do it for the vlog to hopefully get some more interesting hands. And this one is going to be at least a little bit interesting. End up getting a call by the player next to me. Folds around eventually. Just double checking. I still have this beautiful, beautiful hand. Get a three bet to 17 total by the big blind. And by the way, if you want to guarantee that you get zero fold equity, that's the number to choose because I am never, ever, ever, ever folding for 17 total in this situation ever. So we end up calling. So does middle position go three way to it. It is eight, seven, four rainbow. We have a backdoor flush draw. He fires for 14 and I call. Don't really see much reason to raise. Definitely not going to fold and just going to make some decisions going forward from there. Get my change back. Turn is a queen of hearts. The big blind pretty quickly checks. Obviously, at this point with the net flush draw, I'm pretty happy with my hand overall. And a lot of players will opt to check this. I think checking is totally fine. I take a few moments before eventually deciding to fire out for, I believe, 26 total. And this is one where I think the player to the left of me can definitely continue with some second best hands. I think, obviously, they're going to continue with the better stuff, the queen and the eight. But I think there are worse sevens in their range. Uh, there's four X. I think that there's also a bunch of different draws. And... I think this is fine against him, against the other player. You know, could he have a queen? Sure. Could he continue with pocket jacks or pocket tens? Sure. He might actually fold it, actually. Turns out he did actually end up folding it uh, after he ended up explaining what happened after this hand. But he ends up folding. Go heads up to the river, which is an eight of spades. So obviously it minimizes the number of eight X combos. I pretty quickly check. 
They ask what the previous size bet was. Dealer says 26. So he decides to fire for 27. And I snap call and end up beating his shown king seven of clubs. So win a nice little $200 pot with middle-ish pair. And, you know, it's just one of those where given the size of the bet and the overall odds, I'm just not finding a full button here. He can make enough betting mistakes. I don't really see much reason to fold on the river. I don't see much reason to raise. I also don't see much reason to bet either. I think there's going to be a bunch of like withdraws in their range that I'd rather give them an opportunity to bet with rather than just kind of bet and allow them to play really, really perfectly against it. And just for the record, MP1, when I originally sat down at this table and there was that whole kerfuffle again, uh, was asked, hey, is are you comfortable with me filming? And he's like, yeah, I hope you do. And I really want to be recorded and on the vlog. So here you are. Welcome to it. You got on the vlog. Thank you so much. And yeah, it's kind of a suck spot for you with King Seven, but I definitely would not be firing that on the river. I don't really see what that bet is going to accomplish that's going to be good for you. Just going to end up losing an extra 27 bucks, a decent chunk of the time versus just show it down and play forward from there. So that's this hand with eight, seven, a seven, lo siento. Let's move on to the next one. A little bit later on in the session, we are in the cutoff. There's a button straddle, and button straddle in this room means action starts in the small blind. Ba -ba -ba. Look down, look at one card. But the blinds fold. Under the gun limps for five. This person, the size limp behind, he's already talking about possibly going home. I think he's on his like third or fourth $100 rebuy. Another limper, and we have King-10 off, decide to attack to 35. I really can't help myself. This is just a, a totally standard thing with roughly 20 and change dead money out there. I really like to fight for these rather than playing these passively, and I, I don't see much reason to do that. So I end up facing an all-in from this guy, kind of has that gambler shrug with it for roughly 105 total. This guy doesn't take much time before shoving it, and here we are. So it's about 157, give or take, total on that shove. And obviously with King-10 off, not the strongest hand in the world, I'm sure your default thought is this is a pretty standard fold. We definitely don't have enough equity. But here's kind of the issue, right? We're getting about two and a half to one odds on this one. And we don't need a tremendous amount of equity to do okay. And you're looking at this and probably saying, well, yeah, of course we don't have enough equity to make this call. But if we pull this out and you can, again, use that same spreadsheet from earlier, just use the coin shoves sheet down on the bottom, plug in the numbers. So 310 pot right this moment, 122 to call. And this is a little broad strokey because we're not considering things like the side pot. There would be a side pot for roughly, what, 100-ish against the player with the larger stack. But if we just kind of smooth this out and say, okay, roughly, what does this look like as a call? You know, if we have 20% equity, Obviously, this is not a good call. So think for a moment about how much equity you think that we have in a spot like this. And at first glance, you're like, well, definitely not enough. And I don't necessarily blame you for that thought either. But if we plug in our King-10 off in Equilab and run it against a couple different ranges, let's run the first caller with something like this. And it's weird too, because like they didn't isolate, right? There's the button straddle, under the gun to side to limp. They didn't isolate, so I'm kind of removing like a lot of the strong hands from their range. So I'm looking at things like, you know, pocket sixes, pocket fives that limped behind, and now is like, well, I'm definitely not going to fold against this guy. My image at this point was not uh, necessarily the most sane individual in the world. So let's just say that the first shover is shoving something like this. They don't really want to fold. They're kind of already talking about just gambling. So I think that seems decent against the other guy. Let's just say something like this. Again, like you wouldn't think that pocket nines or pocket eights would be in here. Maybe it is, though, just because they limped behind, they weren't very attacky preflop, and maybe something like an ace-jack, again, that they didn't want to isolate, but they definitely don't want to fold right this moment either. So we plug in those kind of hands, do an evaluation on it, and, you know, we have, what, roughly 33% equity? I mean, that's probably a lot more than you were thinking that we originally had. And if that's the case, this is a profitable call. Again, smoothed out, not factoring in the side pot or anything like that. 
And even if there were, you know, wider hands in one of their ranges or, you know, a little bit tighter in another, you know, most of the time we're going to be looking at something around the 28% ballpark, which is roughly break even. Now, throwing in 122 bucks on a purely break even call is not going to be all that great and not something I would advise in the long run, but I'm here to do fun things for the vlog. And it's one of those where, whatever, right? If we win, cool. Is someone probably rebuys with a little bit of tilt. And if we lose, well, whatever. At least they have more depth later when the stacks eventually get a little bit larger, hopefully. So end up making the call. Again, this is not great. This guy over here is saying, oh, the second shover definitely has kings. I'm like, I think pocket sixes is more likely to be in there. Unfortunately, the way the board rolls out, we end up improving nothing, king high, and he shows pocket queens. So pocket queens is obviously not something that I expected to be in there a decent chunk of the time as a default. But when I go back and I replay the hand and really slow it down in my head, I'm like, oh wait, there was a slight speed thing. There was a slight hand movement that I didn't originally factor for. And this is just a reminder that I need to slow down and factor that in. Because if that range starts to you know, have a lot more hands in the strong side of the spectrum, maybe some aces, some queens, and I don't know, maybe tens because he was a little more passive preflop, you know, this equity is going to drop a little bit. And, you know, it just really depends on how you build these ranges out. You can build these in a way that gets it slightly profitable. You can build it in a way that makes it slightly losing. But, you know, with that $5 straddle on, I mean, we're looking at what, roughly 20 big blinds effective against the first shover, roughly 30 big blinds effective against the other guy. Like, because we're functionally playing 2 5 with the $5 straddle on. And I don't know, I, I'm here to, to risk a little bit. I'm not going to play mega risk averse. And with the larger isolation size, I don't really find much reason to fold here. If my isolation size were smaller and I'm getting much worse pot odds, very, very different. Obviously this is not going to be the most lucrative shove. In, I'm sorry, call of a shove at the entire world, but at the end of the day, I'm okay with it. So if you like it and would call two, give it a thumbs up. If you wouldn't, Still give the video a thumbs up if you're enjoying it so far. And then let's move on to the next hand. So a little bit later on in the session, find ourselves on the button. Bunch of preflop folds. On the button with queen nine offsuit. There's a raise to seven from the cutoff, who is our buddy with pocket queens from the last hand. And you can make an argument for just three bidding this ourselves. Personally, I'm going to defend here a lot on the button with no squeezers and the small blinds and going to take position a decent chunk of the time. So end up getting going heads up to it. No complaints so far. Flop is eight, seven, six rainbow. They check a fire out for 10. And you can make an argument that this could be a little bit larger. I think I like something like 13 to 15, a little bit more. I think 10 is just a shade small. They check call. Turn is the two of spades. They check again pretty quickly. And I fire for 21. So I know there's a lot of players that would consider just checking this behind instead, trying to see the draw for cheap. But I think if you actually run this out and do some exploration on it, it's going to be a much more profitable spot to double barrel instead. Just simply because what are they really check calling the flop with? I mean, if they're check calling it with something like jacks and tens, like, okay, cool. But more often than not, they're going to have maybe one pair of hands, maybe like ace, king, king, queen, high, that is not really developing very much with that deuce of spades in the turn. I could have a tremendous amount of this board as well. And even if they call the turn, right, they're probably calling with what, like one pair of hands, a decent chunk of the time. I mean, the plan is really just to make their life a living hell on the river and expect a very, very big bet. I don't think that they're going to love a kind of triple barrel line with an overbet on the river with a single pair of hands. Again, a spot where I can have a lot of decent value stuff or it looks like I could. And as such, I think going for the double barrel, setting up for the triple barrel is going to be far more lucrative than just going for the bet check bet line, which I think a lot of players will try to take. And I just don't think it's going to be as high of EV as going for the double barrel. And again, half-ish pot on the turn, I think is okay. Could be a tad larger, maybe 25 or 30 on the turn instead of just 20 but it will get the job done and nonetheless win a small to medium sized pot and onwards to the next hand. Final hand of interest in this session. We are under the gun plus one. 
No straddles on. 8-7 of diamonds. Very pretty hand. Limp from under the gun. I decide to isolate here. Just chose 11. 11 seemed to be doing the job a decent chunk at this stage in the game. Table dynamics had definitely shifted over time. And I just prefer isolating and going for the attack mode rather than limping this behind. I know a lot of players would like to limp this, but I think it's going to be better to go for this instead. So end up going to 11, cutoff calls, small blind decides to squeeze to 27 total, and, you know, it's better than that 17 squeeze from earlier, but still, this is a little bit too small as far as I'm concerned, and you're giving me odds plus position, plus the cutoff is just never, ever going to format based upon the way they've been playing. This is just one of those where I'm going to call it's a little bit loose fine, but by the same token, like, again, you're not maximizing fold equity by any stretch of the imagination, and that's just not something you really want to be doing when you're choosing your squeeze sizes preflop, in my opinion. So we end up making the call of 27 total. The cutoff calls as well. Again, was never expecting a four bet from them. The flop comes out queen, jack, eight, rainbow. We do have a backdoor flush draw with our eight, seven. Small bind decides to check, and I fire out for 22. It's just one of those where I think our opponents are going to play very, very predictably at this point. I don't think it needs to be much larger than that, and like 22 is going to fold out things like pocket sixes and pocket fives and all that kind of stuff from the cutoff. Like going bigger doesn't really do anything. Going bigger also doesn't fold out like queen X or jack X from either of these players either. I think raises from these players are going to be very, very predictable regardless of my size. I don't think it like creates more races from these players and if the small body decides to like check call like that looks a lot like ace king as far as i'm concerned or maybe like pocket tens or pocket nines peels went off but ultimately i think this is going to get the job done just just fine end up getting called by the cutoff after a little bit the small body decides to call as well double check yep still eight seven of diamonds dealer makes some change out so at this point, pot around 150, turn is the deuce of diamonds, quicker check from the small blind. I decide to check this as well. If we just think about kind of the way that this is normally going to play out, I think the cutoff at this point is going to check a lot of their hands that they should bet behind. I think the small blind is still pretty capped out at like ace-king or the occasional pair that's better than mine. Sure, a barrel will get rid of them, but I don't think a barrel is going to get rid of the cutoff a lot of the time. This is somebody who had been kind of one of those players, you know, who starts with, when you sit down at the table, they have like three or four times a buy-in, but it's just been dwindling nonstop, losing every single pot, playing very, very passively, really winning nothing of import, and just losing a bunch of small to medium-sized pots. This was that player. And I did not think that they were going to fold like Queen X, Jack X, didn't think they were going to bet it either. And I just think checking this, taking the free card in the three-way pot is going to be a little bit better rather than firing this. I think like what happens here, we're going to see Rivers for fairly cheap, a decent drink of the time. That is factored into my thought process on the flop, by the way, when it comes to firing that bet. It's just going to be very, very easy to play turns and rivers regardless of what happens on the flop. Regardless of whether one calls on the flop or both call on the flop, that's kind of all been factored out here. So check behind on the turn, cutoff checks back as well. River is a six of hearts. I decide to check because, again, what does a bet really accomplish at this point? End up showing my hand and not shocking. Small blind has exactly what we thought with ace king. And we're going to take this down with a nasty little pair of eights. Wee! And that is that hand. So again, the had the small blind chosen a better three bet size, I'm probably gone here a lot of the time. And the biggest points of this are whether to bet the flop or check it, and then whether to bet the turn or check that. I think the river is totally face up and straightforward, but it is really, really important that you nail those flop and turn lines, especially in three bet pots where these stakes can get a little bit riskier and those mistakes can get really, really costly. 
but overall nice little result in a medium sized pot no complaints if you have any questions on the hand make sure to leave a comment down below and i'd be happy to run you through any extra thought processes or answer any questions you may have and as for the total session overall we played for roughly four hours from about 9 p.m to one in the morning we made a whopping 13 bucks which comes out to what three and a quarter per hour give or take and roughly six and a half bb per hundred so not the most crushing session in the entire world but they happen nonetheless i'm to blame that damn king 10 hands so ultimately that is this one that is vlog number two in the books hopefully you enjoyed if you have any comments or questions please as always do not hesitate to let me know and a thumbs up would be massively appreciated if you want to see more vlogs in the future these definitely take longer to make but if you're enjoying them i can definitely continue prioritizing them in the video schedule so that's going to wrap it up for this thank you again so much as always for hanging out and if you want more of those spreadsheets that i talked about earlier again splitsuit com slash sheets to download those for totally free today or you can always throw in a couple of chips and i'll throw in a bunch of good goodies if you do that as well go check it out again splitsuit.com slash sheets and i will see you back in another episode shortly in the meantime good luck out there and happy grinding